I don't mean to be so bold, but you know sometimes when you get to sing the blues, it gets kind of good to you. You get so damn good to me till I have to preach it. Hey everybody, it's Chris, your blues guy. Welcome back to Blues Guy Vinyl. Cheers. Hot coffee. Anyway, how's it going, eh? Thanks for tuning in, joining me here today. What's happening, baby? Uh, I'll tell you what's happening. Whew. It went off the rails. It went right off the rails. This is now my third attempt at this video. First attempt, I'll get into in a second. And the second attempt was me ranting about how badly my first attempt went that I went off on this crazy, blue in the face, sweaty toothed, maniacal tangent with lots of screaming and colorful four lettered words. So, this is now, I don't know, third time's a charm, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, initially what happened was uh, I had my records, right? I've got uh, four to show on this video, by the way. Had the records, had everything ready to go, camera set up and all that, right? Had a whole thing done in the background here for Halloween, right? And uh, you know how I usually do my thing here at Blue Sky Vinyl. I show my recent purchases or I talk about something or whatever, and I always have some music playing in the background. Then I show the album cover to whatever's playing in the background. And I try to make it, you know, uh, linked to something. Maybe uh, the day that video goes up, it's an artist's birthday that day. Maybe it's Muddy Waters' birthday or something, or who knows. In this case, Halloween. So I was playing Halloween-related blues and rhythm and blues, which was uh, Screaming Jay Hawkins' uh, compilation album of his singles from 54 to 57. And it's got to put a spell on you on there and a bunch of his like spooky voodoo-related you know, blues music and rhythm and blues. And, uh, you know, she put the whammy on me, my favorite of his, by the way. So I had that going in the background. I do my video, and it's all the, the whole Halloween thing, right? And not a long video, right? 25 minutes, 20 minutes. Get it all done. Do the editing for it, which takes like 10 minutes at, at the most. That renders. Boop, upload it to YouTube. And right away, I'm noticing that it says it's going to take an hour to upload this like 20 minute video. And I'm thinking that's, that's, that's unusual. It's very odd. Um, it's usually 10 minutes, 15 maybe. I thought, okay, it's busy traffic night on the Wi-Fi interwebs. Beep, boop, pop, pop, beep, machine, whatever. I don't know, right? So, okay, fine. So it does its thing, and I go, I go off and do my thing, and I come back, and it's done, and it says, Pfft, it's blocked. Blocked worldwide. No, nobody's allowed to see this thing. I'm like, what the hell? So I look uh, as to why it's blocked, and they blocked it for, I put a spell on you, and I'm like, ah, oh, okay, sure, of course. Even though you can find videos of that all over YouTube, of people just uploading that song and doing a slideshow of spooky pictures, but anyway. I'm like, okay, fine. But then the other one that uh, was the reason, the other song that was the reason it was blocked was Guitar Slim's The Things That I Used To Do. I'm like, no. I'm saying to myself, no, no. It's, uh, it's not Guitar Slim. This is Screaming Jay Hawkins that I was playing. And he doesn't even cover the things that I used to do. And if he did, it was it's not on this album. Like, what the hell, YouTube, right? So I'm like, okay, I can dispute this, no problem. So I click on dispute, and I scroll down to that song, click on it, but in the list of their pre-built reasons that you're disputing, there's nothing in there about, hey, you've, you pinched me for the wrong song, dummies, you know. So, anyways, that video pff, was blocked. So, that's then I tried to redo it and in talking about like I just did I went off on a tirade about YouTube and uh, it's it, it got dodgy it got messy I almost shut the whole thing down at one point but anyway everything's fine now I had some dinner so I made sure I wasn't hangry I had a, I had a cigarette 
I've got my uh, hot beverage. Everything's, everything's good now. So I've got four <laughs> records to show. Happy Halloween, by the way. And going forward, there's not going to be any music in the background anymore. You know, because, uh, you know, as if my videos weren't super spectacular, high tech enough already. Now there isn't even going to be, you know, any ambient music, blues or rhythm and blues or whatever playing in the background. Now you'll be hearing traffic going by in the summer. You'll hear police sirens. It's, it's going to be great. Anyway, uh, four records to show. Without further ado, let's get into this thing here, shall we? No matter what YouTube says, we shall. Uh, the first one is a local Canadian band. Um, I can't. I was trying to think of who do I even compare these these guys to for you, Bubkis. I got nothing. Nothing. Um, it's a band called the Northern Pikes, and I've been keeping my, all four of my eyes peeled for this album for ten years. Um, I mean, yeah, sure, I, you know, I can get it online, on CD or whatever, but no, I wanted the vinyl, right? And little did I realize that there's something special about this vinyl. Now, I just wanted it for a, a dumbass reason. Now, tell me if you've ever done this. I bought this album, and I paid 30 bucks for it, by the way, and I bought it for two songs. Have you ever done some dumbass shit like that? Spent 25, 30 or more bucks on an album for one or two songs, maybe three songs. I'm, I'm not talking an EP here or you know, a full length album. That's some dumbass shit, but great. Really the one song is super awesome. The, the other song is really great. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. the band is the Northern Pikes. Okay. And this album is uh, uh, Big Blue Sky, 1987 it was released. Um, found this it's just in like perfect condition near mint one would hazard to say uh had the original inner sleeve in it with song lyrics liner notes credits this and that and the other right but uh of course when i saw it in the bin at the record store over at heritage posters and music i pulled it out and i then i pulled the vinyl out to have a look Quel surprise! You kind of forget because, you know, colored vinyl is all, all up in your face lately, right? For the past few years. You kind of forget, you know, in the 80s, and the 70s, 60s, even in the 50s, colored vinyl. So I pulled out this semi-transparent or translucent blue vinyl here. I was, I was shocked. I was baffled and befuddled but bemused as well. So it's on Virgin Records, obviously. Uh, the title, Big Blue Sky, is mentioned from 1987. The two songs, you may be asking, what did Blue Sky do such a jackass thing and pay 30 bucks for two songs? What two songs are they? First one, Teen Land. The second one, The Things I Do for Money. Excellent songs. If you look them up on the interwebs machine, you'll find them, Spotify or whatever the kids today do. I don't know. I'm, I'm a low tech guy. But yeah. Great, great album. Actually it was kind of the extra bonus surprise on top of it being colored vinyl and all that and everything being in there and intact. The whole album. Terrific. Every song. Excellent. So just you know, made it, made it, made that 30 bucks a little bit less sweaty. Whatever that means. Anyway, uh, these next three are new reissues, reissues of classic blues albums. Uh, this first one originally released in 1968. This is the 2017, nope, sorry, back that up, 2016 reissue on uh, Golden Lane Records. Um, this is Junior Wells' album, uh, it's a solo album, Junior Wells' You Were Tough Enough. And I'm a huge fan, first of all, of Junior Wells. Amos Blakemore Jr., Junior Wells. One of my favorite blues harp players, blues harmonica players, but also a great singer. Just a really powerful, booming voice, sort of a growl to it in a lot of ways. Um, 
He's got a lot of attitude. He's very macho, you could tell, just in the way he sings, right? He's very confident. And a lot of, you know, these blues cats were, right? It's almost like they transformed once they got on stage or got in front of a microphone in the studio, right? Uh, this persona that they created about themselves, for themselves, to project into their art form kind of comes out, right? But Junior Wells was no phony. And this album, man, I've got seven or eight Junior Wells studio albums, two, yeah, two live albums from Junior Wells as well. And then a whole bunch that he did with Buddy Guy through the late 60s, early 70s. He's just excellent. He's an excellent bluesman. But this album is not a blues album. Hardly at all. In fact, he hardly even plays harmonica in this. So at first when I was, you know, listening to it and letting it play through and stuff, I kept waiting for the, you know, the break where he'd do a cool little harmonica solo or something. And 75% of the album, there's... There's no harp at all, which is, I mean, that's fine. it's fine. What he does throw in there is exquisite, as always. Lots of pop and punch and crunchiness. Again, a lot of energy um, to the way he plays the harp. He really hits the one or really gets on the one. And uh, yeah, it's just, he's just got a great style. Uh, but this is really more of a funk or a soul album than it is a blues album. Uh, I know that they were trying some stuff with Junior Wells and the aforementioned Buddy Guy in the 60s and 70s. Um, you know, blues has always kind of had these ebbs and flows, ups and downs, peaks and valleys, whatever. And in the late, mid to late 60s, it was on a little bit of a downturn before it kind of came up again in the late 60s, early 70s, and kind of crescendoed again before, you know, doing its thing. And uh, I think a lot of blues artists, Junior Wells, Buddy Guy, a lot, tons actually, started doing more sort of soul-influenced music or soul music, funk, uh, because these were sort of the emerging genres, most especially soul in the late 60s. And this was becoming the, the more favored musical genre. R&B had already turned to rock and roll and gone to the white kids, supposedly, or whatever, right? Um, disco hadn't been, it wasn't around yet. Funk was still quite young. So blues was kind of seen as your dad, your uncle, your auntie's music. You know, if you were a young, most especially African-American kid. If you were a young black kid in the 60s, you weren't necessarily running to the blues. But if it was funky and soulful like this, I think you would grab onto it and I think really enjoy it. So I think if you are into soul and funk, and just kind of warming up to the blues, this would be an excellent, excellent first step through the door, as it were. And I love that shot of Junior in the back, too. Kind of reminds me of those old Capitol record, you know, with Frank Sinatra. And check out that fool's medallion. It's got a Sammy thing going on. Anyway, great album. Uh, reissue. Oh, that's, yeah, it's a shorter label, dummy. Why not? It's on that uh, golden lane. Kind of a teal green. Nothing super fancy. Looks like that's supposed to be Junior in there. Mr. Amos Blake Moore Jr. Yeah, 1968 reissued in 2016. Uh, the next one's another reissue. This one, much more of a straight up blues. In fact, uh, more of an acoustic blues. Uh, so much so, it's just this, this guy, his guitar, and then you can hear his foot either tapping or stomping, depending on the tempo. Of the song, Sam Lightning Hopkins, uh, a great album. Not a really archaic, primitive sounding uh, acoustic blues album where it's just a guy and his guitar. Don't get me wrong, okay? It's not those that stuff taken from those old scratchy 78s from the 1930s. I mean, I love that stuff, but that might not be your bag. And this, that's not what this is. This is uh, from 1959, his debut album. This is a reissue from 2017, and this one's on Vinyl Lovers. And by the way, these these three, uh, the Junior, this one, and the next one I'll show, uh, they were all on sale on Amazon. So, you know, uh, they were each came in around $20 Canadian. Uh, most were between $5 and $10 savings. So, you know, 
I figured I'm going to jump on this because there was no way I'm going to find an OG of this at a reasonable price. I mean, 20, pff, that's a pipe dream. Double that, even 50 bucks. Good luck. At least not around here. So, very happy to pick it up. Vinyl Lovers, uh, 2017 reissue. And like I said, it's not one of those primitive sounding acoustic blues albums. Don't get me wrong. This is Leighton Hopkins I'm talking about here. He's a Texas bluesman. And he's got a lot of boogie to the way he plays. Not John Lee Hooker boogeyman type boogie. But I mean, it's... There's a, sh there's a lot of shuffle, there's a lot of movement to his music. It's not just sit your butt down and listen to me tell a sad story kind of blues on, on this here guitar while I sing. No, he's got um, little riffs and licks in there that you can tell, you know, went on to influence the rock and roll guys because there's a lot of sort of rock and roll reminiscent sounds to the way that Lightman Hopkins plays. He's got a great voice, very powerful. It's got a little bit of that southern drawl being from Texas. It's really noticeable to a Canadian for sure, eh? Well, for sure there, bud. But it lends itself to the fact that he's got one foot in blues and one foot, it seems, almost in early, early rock and roll. Um, the album is a nice blend of slower blues tunes and more up-tempo, what you would just call dance numbers or shuffle numbers. And it has that sort of rock and roll kind of, um, I don't know, juke and jive kind of a feel to it. You know what I mean? Um, it makes you want to just get up and shake your ass, is what I've said. Uh, so it's a 180 gram vinyl. A really nice center label on this one with Mr. Sam Lightning Hopkins himself there. Uh, it sounds really, really good. You know, um... It's, I know it can be a bit of a gamble, and a lot of people poo-poo the Vinyl Lovers uh, reissues, but I think most especially on older, uh, you know, when they reissue older records, I mean, these things are kind of crackly and scratchy sounding, even hot off the press anyways. A few exceptions, you know, Chess, and, you know, Vanguard, and a few other blues labels, you know, VJ and stuff like that. Um, but uh, that said, you know, excellent quality. Uh, one little nitpick, and it's it's not in the pressing or anything like that, but I do notice a sudden change in sound quality with two songs, and that's because there were bonus tracks that were recorded a couple of months later. This initially was recorded with um, Samuel Charters as the producer in Houston in 1959, and a couple of months later, Mac McCormick brought Leighton Hopkins into the studio to record a few tracks, and two of them ended up as bonus tracks on here. And what they did was they put one at the end of side one and the other at the end of side two. So there's the track listing. You can see the bonus tracks there with a little asterisk. So the thing is, you, you, can, you can tell that it's a different recording session. Um, because there's just a slight drop in the audio quality. It's not terrible. It's not night and day. It just sounds a little thinner, a little more tin, tinier, tin can-ish. If you know what I'm saying, you know, not, not terrible by any means. It's just you notice it because it comes directly after the, you know, the studio track, right? So had they maybe put them together at the end of the album, again, you'd still notice it, but then from track, from, you know, one bonus track to the next, it would be more consistent. I don't know. It's, it's hard to say, but that's just a nitpick. That's not taken away from the album at all. It's, it's a terrific album. Really great. Like I said, acoustic. But it's got a real rocking sort of feel to it. Lightning Hopkins, his guitar, his foot stamping or ta uh, tapping or stamping or stomping. And that's it. And really, that's all you need. Great voice, too, if I didn't mention that a million times. He does some great stuff on his guitar. A lot of bending, a lot of um, sustained notes and stuff. And he does a lot of cool tricks. And that was kind of the thing, too, right? Because he was... A street performer as well as a recording artist so you have to have some cool tricks that you could do to entertain the crowd visually and a lot of that you can pick up on the way he's playing even when he's in the studio so yeah really happy to grab that last one here today uh, this one um, same deal as the others you know 20 bucks it's a reissue this one originally uh, was released in 1960 and this is a 2018 reissue again on vinyl lovers 180 gram vinyl. 
All of these came with uh, poly lined inner sleeve, which is really nice. Because sometimes, again, that can be a gamble. You uh, get the cheap paper sleeve and you gotta swap it out. So this is BB King, King of the Blues. The center label is a little sort of understated because it's classy and everything, but you know, it's not as flashy as the others. Um, but the cover more than makes up for it. Wow, look at that. There's old BB. Now I love all three Kings of the Blues. Love Freddie, love Albert, but BB is my favorite of the three Kings. To me, he's the King of the Blues. And uh, the album title says it all right there. And this is just an incredible album. Okay, there's a little blurb here on the bottom from uh, Tom Durek. I guess he's some you know, journalist, music journalist. But it says, King of the Blues is a stellar look at a young, cocky, guitar-slinging B.B. King. And uh, yeah, I would agree. This is B.B. right in the sort of the meat of the bell curve, if you will. Right, right, as he's kind of in the height of his powers, right where I want him, right where a lot of us really would agree that BB was at his best. So sort of that period between 57 and 58, right to about 77, 78, you know, that sort of 20, even 25 year-ish stretch there where he was just untouchable. I mean, he was the man, you know, he was hanging out with the rock and roll dudes and influencing them, but also trading stuff with them and pulling in a little bit of the rock and roll into his playing. He always had a bit of a jazzy feel to his chord progressions and that sort of thing. I mean, he was hugely influenced by Charlie Christian and Django Reinhardt and Lonnie Johnson. And these guys were a lot jazzier than they were bluesy. Although Lonnie Johnson could kind of go either way, depending on what venue he played, right? But... That comes across in B.B.'s playing. His voice, stellar. Right? This is, again, you know, he's still young and powerful here on this album. So his voice is just, he's hitting the high notes. He's getting those, those deep sort of guttural sort of sounds. Uh, just, just exceptional. And his guitar playing is just out of this world. I mean, he comes out of the blue with all kinds of stuff at you. He's still... He's, at this point, he's still Im improvising a lot in his solos and stuff. He hasn't, I mean, let's face it, right? As he was getting on in years and once he got into the 2000s and he was quite old at this point and ill health and he would just sit for the whole show, he'd maybe play five songs and yada yada for a bit and off he'd go, right? And still seeing a legend, of course, fantastic, but not like he was in the 1960 or even 1970. At that point, unfortunately, he had, for lack of a better term, almost become a one-trick pony with a lot of his solos. They started to sound very much alike and playing less and less notes and less and less of what he called his, his trilling, right, to get that sort of tremolo sound. Um, but that's, that's neither here nor there. That's definitely not the case with this album. This album is just... I mean, everything is, I mean, I've got a right to love my baby, feel like a million, uh, the woman I love, good man gone bad, I'm king, just on and on. Um, the other thing, too, with BB was his band, right? I mean, he just had a great band. So you pair up somebody with gospel-tinged voice with BB, the, the guitar playing that he did is just incredible, again, especially in this time period, and he put together a really hot band look out son like you just it's it's hard to describe uh, he's like a his band was like a steamroller just steady coming at you focused boom relentless but on the other hand it's not slow or heavy it's he always had a bit of a swing to the way not only he played as a band leader bb himself but the whole band uh, they had sort of a yeah kind of a, a for lack of a better term, a swing to the way that they played. So it's this weird sort of duality with BB and his band, you know? It's like, I don't know, you take a steamroller and put it on an aircraft carrier, the steamroller's doing its thing and the aircraft carrier's swinging on the waves. Uh, I don't know, I'm rambling at this point. But I gotta tell you, as a shout out, Marshall York, the bass player on this album, that's, I can't even, words, fail. All I can do is make noises and faces. Yeah. Get at it. The guy's amazing. Amazing. 
And that's part of that whole sound, right? It's part of that whole, I mean, B.B., Ray Charles, um, uh, Roy Brown, uh, James Brown. Like, they, they put together tight bands. Howlin' Wolf, uh, some maybe more taskmasters than others. Uh, some maybe a little more easygoing, but these were legitimate band leaders that understood the importance of a band and that you you know, the band elevates you, and then by you being elevated, you bring them along with you, and you elevate them. And, it, you know, it just brings the music to a whole new levels. And, uh, I mean, that's definitely the case for all four of those records. But, yeah, don't shy away from the B.B. King in, in that time period, you know, 60s, 70s. Just incredible. Just incredible. You can blow anybody away. And just so powerful and soulful in the voice. Incredible stuff. So there you go. I think I've gone on long enough here. Uh, I think that's going to do it today for your blues guy. As always, let me know what you think down below and do all the other YouTube stuff. Help me out here. Cause I, cause I, I'm, I'm dying over here. YouTube is hammering me with these, you know, these, uh, whatever you call them, copyright blockages. It's, it's not a strike. Like I'm not in YouTube jail or anything, but the video's blocked and this is... I don't know, like the sixth time, like, like Muddy Waters on his deathbed told Buddy Guy, "Got to keep these blues alive." But it's just what I'm trying to do here in the VC YouTube. I'm just trying to keep these blues alive, share it with the good people. Don't punish me now. Anyways, I'm starting to rant again, so I'm gonna leave it there. Thanks a lot for uh, tuning in. Appreciate it as always. And uh, you know, keep digging, keep spinning. Until the next one, have a good one and happy Halloween. I guess. A candle holder back here, the orange. There, where is it? There it is. It's shaped like a pumpkin. So I guess that's Halloween enough. Boo!